Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Professor Danny Kelly. I'm the Royal College of Nursing Chair of Nursing Research at Cardiff University. And I'm also the convener of the RCN Fellows, a group of people that we are perhaps uh, needing to hear a bit more from. And that's why these events have been established to hear from people that uh, really have been pioneers in the world of nursing. And these evening public lectures from wherever you are in the world are open to you to join, to hear from our pioneers. And on this International Nurses Day, it's especially fitting to welcome you and hope that you find this both an interesting and informative uh, series of uh, discussions that we'll have this evening. We've got a wonderful uh, panel of uh, contributors. All three are fellows of the Royal College of Nursing. And so they will be sharing their own perspective about the importance of politics and its role in nursing. And perhaps it's never been as important as now for nurses to have a voice and to share that voice and to make change happen. You can find out more about the RCN Fellows, including nominating uh, colleagues for this honour via the RCN website, which you can uh, visit and then look for the Fellows page and you'll find lots of information there. And each year we do appoint a number of Fellows. We'll be announcing our new Fellows at the RCN Congress in just a few weeks. So it's a very warm welcome to this event. As I say, wherever you are in the world, you are very welcome. And we hope that you will enjoy and come back to our next Pioneers in Nursing event later this year, which will probably be on the theme of nurses and mental health. So without further ado, I'm now going to pass over to our chair for this evening, who is Jim Campbell. Now, Jim has kindly agreed to undertake this role for us. He's had a busy few days recently that he may tell us about as director of the Health Workforce Department at the World Health Organization. Jim brings a wealth of experience of uh, the, the international perspective of nursing demand and nursing development and potential. And I know that there has a, just been a, a statement launched, I think it's hot off the press today, from the triad of the WHO, the International Council of Nurses, and the International Confederation of Midwives. So maybe Jim will be able to tell us about that a little bit later. So for now, I will pass over to Jim and thank him for taking on this role for this evening. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, or very uh, early, early morning to some people. I see somebody's joining us from Australia, where it's 2 a.m. Uh, welcome to the people from North America, from Canada, uh, from the four home nations, from India, uh, and then all parts of, of the UK that, that we're seeing there. Um, absolute pleasure to be with you and joining you on International Nurses Day. Uh, and indeed, as Daniel was just saying, we've, we've spent the last three days here in Geneva convening um, over 700 participants uh, daily from around the world, over 100 countries represented, uh, members, uh, government chief nursing and midwifery officers, presidents of national nursing associations, presidents of midwifery associations, education regulators, uh, to, to be talking about exactly some of these most pressing issues that nurses and midwives are facing around the world today, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, looking at some of the data and the issues that we're, we're seeing around the world. More than three quarters of countries have experienced 
labour protests and disputes around working conditions, around the the burden uh, of the managing the pandemic and essential health services. Uh, that obviously, whenever we see labour disputes, starts to stimulate uh, politics and policy about what are the the underlying policy issues, the underlying challenges uh, for the nursing workforce. And that's going to be part of our theme today. It is International Nurses Day with the theme of which is uh, a voice to lead. How do we invest in nursing to respect rights and, and secure global health? And we've got a wonderful, wonderful panel. Uh, as Daniel said, this is part of the RCN Fellows Initiative bringing distinguished uh, nursing scientists, educationalists, uh, and people engaged in uh, the work to actually come together uh, to, to input and inform some of the personnel that are still actively engaged in the delivery. Uh, we've got um, some wonderful, uh, Jane uh, Salvage, Nestling Watson Jury, David Benton, and I'll ask each of them just to do a slight intro for themselves on the first time they speak, um, the, who I have the pleasure to know and work with. Um, we're going to have, in terms of the agenda, we're going to have a, a quick discussion and we'll put up a slide shortly around Catherine Hall, um, uh, the General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing, and uh, herself uh, an innovator, a leader, uh, making sure that the voice of nurses was represented. I'm going to ask the panel a few questions on, on you know, the, the image that we have, and we're going to use that to start to construct a discussion. Uh, we're going to then come uh, to try and engage with yourself, so please use the chat function uh, that's there, and if we, we have time and the technology serves us right, uh, we may even be able to try and bring a few people in live to ask uh, any particular question to the panelists, and we'll be screening the Q&A and the chat to, to look at that. And then we'll come back to some closing words from the panelists uh, accordingly. So we're going to hopefully um, keep to time and everything else. I was, I was with many, many chief nursing officers yesterday, uh, and I said to them alongside, my role was really the chief timekeeping officer, uh, and that's going to be part of today's role as well. So if I can ask our dear colleagues at RCN to put up um, the slide of Catherine, uh, that will start. And hopefully, even you, you know, where, wherever you're joining from yourselves, you know, what does, what does this image say to you? Uh, this is the, the general secretary of the RCN, you know, with a, a prolific leadership record in the period that she was working, um, a member of the General Medical Council, um, a member of the, the Commission on Industrial Relations. And clearly, I've just mentioned you know, the issues that we're seeing around the world. And we've people joining us from Northern Ireland, people joining us from the other home nations will be aware of some of the tensions that we've been seeing in recent years. I think when Dame Donna Kinnear was uh, on the picket lines a couple of years ago in Northern Ireland, it was the, the first time that we saw uh, uh, Northern Irish nurses on strike in the history of the Royal College of Nurses. So obviously industrial relations, a key issue. But really to, to my panelists, you know, you're, You've experienced uh, personally uh, the, the role of leadership, the role of, of nursing. What does this image say to you uh, outside number 10, outside the seat of, of power in, in the United Kingdom and the parliamentary process? Uh, what does this say to you? Um, Jane, let me come to you, you first. And like I said, if you could just give a, a few short words of introduction so that everybody uh, knows you. Hello, everyone, and greetings from uh, Florence, Italy, which, of course, was the birthplace of Florence Nightingale, and that's why she was called Florence. So it's a particular pleasure to be able to speak to you from, from this uh, gorgeous city. And, of course, it takes me back seeing that picture of Catherine Mary Hall, who was actually General Secretary when I became a student nurse and joined the RCN, which is an awfully long time ago, and I know I don't look anywhere near that age. but um, 
I remember at the time I came fresh from university where I'd been the um, president of my college student union. So I'd already cut my political teeth. There were sit-ins at university. It was a very sort of time of great, enormous political ferment and excitement. And then I came into nursing, which suddenly felt a very sort of conservative place to be. And when I went to RCN Congress for the first time and saw the likes of Catherine Hall, in my ignorance and perhaps arrogance, I thought, well, these people are very old fashioned. But of course, people like Catherine Mary Hall and the other pioneers in the earlier days of nursing were enormously political and had great savvy. And there they were at number 10. And I'm sure whoever was occupying number 10 at the time probably quailed in his boots uh, when he saw her coming. So I became an activist. And just to as a reminder, if anyone remembers this book, which was published rather a long time ago now, with this groovy cover, which again was a bit of a breaking the mold of what nurses were meant to be reading. So at the time, there was lots of discussion whether we should be professional and political. Was it politics with a small P or a big P? There was a lot of um, anxiety around being political. But I think um, we've moved on a long way since then, as evidenced by the kind of discussion we'll have today. And I just want to flag up before I hand back to you how delighted I am that the RCN is back in the International Council of Nurses. Um, many of us campaigned very hard for that return to happen. And it's a bright spot in an otherwise rather gloomy time for the United Kingdom. And being in the ICM reminds us of how global the issues are, that the sort of things that we worry about in the UK, as Jim has indicated, are really in different ways and with different nuances, but they are global issues. And if we are going to solve them meaningfully, then I think we need to be able to join, make common cause with our colleagues across the world. So I think that's my opening thoughts, Jim. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Jane. And indeed, congratulations to the RCN for, for rejoining the International Council of Nurses and for all that work. And um, it's, it's, you know, we, we knew you were an activist from, from the early days and it's still uh, part of your real passion, Jane. We're, we're very much aware of that. Um, I, I think also with, with Dr. Neslin uh, watson Jury. Um, uh, another author and contributor to many issues around leaderships and uh, innovation. Um, your own personal reflections on uh, Catherine Hall here in the photo. And she, please do to give a few words to introduce yourself. Okay. I am Neslin Watson-Drewey. I have had the pleasure of having been involved in nursing, midwifery, health visiting, health promotion, nurse education. and. Uh, I just love the image that Dame Catherine has left for us. She's just such an icon. And what I love about um, this photograph, it actually demonstrates that nursing and nurses need to be at the center of political issues. I cannot think of any aspect of life that nursing and nurses are not really having an impact on. So for me, I really contextualize politics as the conduct and the management of political affairs. And I'm understanding the impact that, they, that politics actually can have on everyday lives. And I certainly accept the broad aspect of politics it takes place in my life, it takes place in your life. And so every person is um, implicitly involved or concerned in creating a just society. And when I look at the, the, the issues that we have been dealing with in the pandemic, you know, the issues around workforce, the issues around ensuring that um, our patients and clients are safe in, in um, ensuring that um, the communities are safe, ensuring that our staff are safe. When I, I then begin to uh, see and perceive politics uh, as from a very public view. And for me, I see politics in every aspect of human activity. Um, 
we know that in nursing, um, politics is so important. You know, nurses are involved from the cradle to the grave, from birth um, to death. And to that end, my area that I take a lot of pleasure in is around leadership and leadership within our institutions, leadership within our professions and government. This is just so um, important. I find that I would have loved to see in every country in the world where the workforce issues of healthcare, nursing and nursing is really at the front and center. Some I remember having a, a discussion uh, some years ago around the importance of nurses stepping into their leadership and being political. And one nurse said to me, so what has politics got to do with nursing? And my response is that I see politics as central to nurses and nursing because we are at the front line. We are at the front line of healthcare. Uh, we have a very unique perspective in seeing people's lives and understanding the impacts of policies on people's lives. We, we, we are working with all sections of the um, community. Politics is just so important when we begin to think about workforce mental health, mental health. Um, the pandemic has really shown us the importance of well-being. Uh, and when I look in our own UK government, for example, and I, I think of, you know, Department of Work and Pension, you know, I, I believe that we should have a nurse on every committee um, within that department. And if we did, we certainly would have better decisions and outcomes um, and how those policies impact upon people, their lives and the whole population. And it is worth saying that um, whatever frameworks uh, we look at in other countries, the same principles apply because nurses are involved with lives from cradle to the grave. We're exposed to the issues of individuals, we're exposed to the issues of families, we're exposed to the issues in communities. And today, as we are in this um, discussion here, we are focusing on nursing and politics. And I do agree that um, health and uh, social care systems need to be safe. And if to, that safety starts at the very beginning of providing an environment within which our workforce can do their best. We know that when we have, have st staff shortages, we do not get the very best care. We know that when the health and mental well-being of our uh, staff are not up to standard, we do not get the best care. We know that when, that when we have sufficient community nurses, that we are able to give better healthcare to communities and keep communities safe. And it was just so short-sighted when I, I saw during the pandemic, when some of us started to resort to taking um, the very skilled community nurses to put them into acute settings without actually actually understanding the value of nursing and the value of community mm -hmm. self. Safety involves- Leslie, you're workforce. getting into some of the issues I want to I want to bring okay. back in a little later. Um, so let me put you put you on hold, but don't don't drop those thoughts. Um, okay. Let me come to David, Dr. David Benton. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Alan Ramsey has, has looked at that photo from Australia and said that it's made the connection with the Iron Lady and Thatcherism um, and the whole issue there. But David, wh wh where are you coming from when you see this picture? Um, thank you very much, Jim, and, and welcome to everyone for International Nurses Day. Um, I'm based here in Chicago. I'm the chief exec of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. And when I look at this picture, there's a number of very key issues for me when I, when I look at this. Firstly, um, I think some of the work that Dame Catherine did in terms of inclusivity, bringing uh, different parts of the nursing profession into a coherent entity, I think is very important. Because if we are to speak with a strong voice, then that has to be a unified voice. So I think some of the work that she did in the 60s and 70s was really very, very important in marshalling 
uh, uh, common thoughts, which then becomes much more difficult for our politicians to um, avoid having a serious discussion and taking action upon. So I think that's one of the key, the key messages I take from this. The other aspect of this, which builds on this idea of inclusivity, is the fact that in her very um, uh, 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 prestigious career, she actually served in many aspects of the nursing role. Um, she was a leader in uh, at hospital level. She was indeed uh, the general secretary. But as you can see from this slide, she also played an important role in advocacy uh, with number 10, but also in terms of uh, trade unionism, in terms of speaking up for the needs of nurses. But importantly for me, the role that she played in both the General Medical Council and the UKCC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, I think is very important because in a, in a sense, that sets the scope um, of the profession, what we can do and how we can do it and how we are educated to do it. So she had a very broad perspective. And I think that's a lesson that we all need to learn in terms of how we work together, not simply looking at it from a trade union perspective or a regulatory perspective or an education perspective, but bringing them all together to actually formulate solutions that can actually advance the health and well-being of the citizens that we serve. So, Jim, those are the thoughts that come to my mind when I see this image. Um, and I can see um, it, behind her eyes a thought of, as I go into number 10, what am I going to be able to achieve today? So I think being clear about what we are trying to achieve is the first step in success. Thank you, David, indeed. And, you know, obviously said that she was a, a regular there in terms of negotiating some of those benefits um, to the members of the RCN and, and get, making sure that collective bargaining, but also putting the patient safety. We heard from Neslin there as well. Uh, Jane, I want to come back to you. The um, Clearly, the role from Catherine here, the RCN has been balancing politics policy. That was... You know, that, that was the, 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 your perspective in your very, very well-known uh, publication that you've put through on the politics of nursing. When, to you, what's the opportunity here for the Royal College of Nursing and the four home nations that it's represented, given many of the challenges we're seeing internationally being played out in the, the four home countries themselves? What, what you know, if it, as a fellow yourself, what can the RCN be doing um, to really take advantage of this, this policy and political role that it has? That's a really good question and quite a difficult one. I think that um, some of the issues that the other colleagues have already raised are very relevant in terms of um, the need to sort of have a clear agreement on what it is we're fighting for, to share our goals, to be really... Um, political in the widest sense, to be very savvy about what we do and how we do it and how we present ourselves. And I think it's easy to say that, but very difficult to do. And one of the issues about an organisation like the RCM, which is, is very big, it's got a lot of members, it's very diverse in its membership. And I don't think it's any secret to say that it's there have been deep divisions within the RCM about, for example, issues about whether we should be in ICN or not. And is our role just to look after paying conditions of our own members here in the UK? Or do we have, as I believe, and of course I think most of us on this call believe, that we have a much wider role to play? So I think there's something perhaps about being honest together, because unity doesn't mean a kind of um, a false sense of, oh, yes, we all agree on the easy things. But perhaps we can learn from our RCN experience and the challenges that we have about how we really can find the common ground and really say, well, these are the issues that we can all fight on together. And I have to say that some of that is around the issues about men and women, um, because of course, um, the majority of nurses, the vast majority, it's about, I think it's still about 90% um, 
worldwide are women, but the higher up the hierarchy you go, the fewer, the lower the percentage of women. And so that brings the issues about representation and um, challenges and how you can ensure that the majority of uh, the women who are nurses actually have a voice and are accepted as having something valid to say and being a full part in the whole sort of picture. And that, of course, I mean, the work I'm currently doing with, um, with WHO around midwifery leadership, you know, you see there in the enormous challenges that women face in so many countries, simply to be recognised, to be heard, to not have to constantly fight on so many fronts and trying to sort of look after the family, the elderly relatives, run the ward, be political, the enormous challenges that women face. So I think those, we have many advantages in the UK, but I think we need to be mindful of that and find some ways of really genuinely seeking common ground without minimising the differences of perspective that are part of what a mass movement should be. Absolutely. Jane, I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought this point up. Um, you know, we've published in the State of the World's Nursing, the State of the World's Midwifery Reports, these global comparisons, some of the challenges of exactly women in the workforce, uh, which are a challenge everywhere, but women in the health and care workforce, especially during the pandemic, have been multiplied over and over again. Occupational segregation sexual violence and harassment in the workplace, uh, gender pay gaps, which are unexplained other than the fact of purely being female. Um, the, the lack of opportunities you mentioned for leadership. Dr. Neslin, please, you, you know, you've been looking at many of this, these issues throughout your career. Um, some perspectives on that. How do we overcome it? We, we, we know the problem. How do we, as leaders and political activists, make the change? I would like to build on all that Jane has already put on the table. And I, I would like to lobby um, very strong to have a stronger nursing voice right across government. I, as I said, you know, on every department that at the, at the moment I am involved primarily in coaching civil servants. And I can actually see in every area of government where a nursing voice could add to better policies. Um, and, and in the end, we would have better outcomes for our populations. So um, from, and, and we can't do it alone. I think this is where the tripartite between the, um, the World Health Organization and the Royal College of Nursing, the Royal College of Midwives and other organizations coming together and really putting the nursing voice strongly across to governments, not in all governments, because I think when we look at um, issues in regard to public health, Public health nurses have such a lot to add to that. Nurses in general have a lot to add um, to better public health, better safety, mental health issues. So yes, lobbying strongly. And I can add later, but that's, yeah. that's where my passion is. Lobbying, exactly. <laughs> David, David, from the, the regulatory perspective, um, you know, obviously the, the, the conditions, the opportunities are all part and parcel of those discussions. But again, what, what, what could we be doing more of? So I, th I think, first of all, we need to think about politics, um, both with a small P and with a big P. So the image of Dame Catherine Hall in front of number 10 is one a big P political venue, but there, are, of course, are others in Edinburgh and Cardiff and in Northern Ireland as well, um, where there are opportunities. And, and indeed, a discussion I had with another uh, general secretary, with Christine Hancock, um, was around the fact that we should be leveraging ambition across the four nations, but also across Europe and across other nations as well. So learning from the experiences and the successes of others and highlighting those as exemplars that we can then move forward. I think part of parcel of the regulatory piece here is recognising that regulation is a tool uh, that can actually support us in terms of moving forward. And regulation is not just something that takes place at a national level or a provincial level, but it actually takes place 
in institutions as well. And many of the barriers to um, working to full scope of practice are actually part and parcel of local policies. So there's a role for the 28 million nurses and 2 million midwives in terms of actively getting involved at the micro level of, of policy and politics within their institutions to actually move forward this agenda in a coordinated way. So I, I think these are some of the things I would highlight in terms of not just simply focusing on the governmental political agenda, but actually thinking really widely about where nurses are. And indeed the point that Nestlin made about actually working within communities, um, within schools and with other settings where there is a real big health dimension. And if you think about the, uh, the sustainable development goals, the impact that nursing can have on issues like climate change and some of these broader impacts that have a fundamental impact on the health and well-being of all. So we really need to um, open our eyes and uh, raise our voices to a much wider set of issues. Really good. And I'm, I'm seeing both Jane and, and Neslin uh, nodding in agreement with some of the comments you've made there, David. Um, so in which case, so, you know, how, how do we encourage, how do we mentor, engage, provide opportunities for the nursing community worldwide. Um, our student nurses, our early career professionals, our, our senior nurse leaders, our, our political leaders. How do we provide opportunity to really enable that? I, we saw the Nursing Now Challenge around the world trying to really invest in this leadership, this voice uh, opportunity. What Again, you know, what's the role of RCN? What's the role of existing nurses? To look at those opportunities, Nestle, let's, let's, you were talking about this community in the school level. What's your thoughts? Yes, and I, I do believe that um, building on, on what David has also put on the table, you know, the importance of, of the nursing and midwifery um, curriculum, the curricula in, in, in general, because Jane had a, a, a strong impact on me in, in the late 1980s. And when I began to think about what is politics and the impact of politics. And I remember when I saw levels of management that were not good enough. And I felt, well, I suppose I was a little bit brazen to think I could make a difference, but I thought I could make a difference. And I literally, I wrote to the Secretary of State and I said, you know, these are issues that actually need to be addressed and I can make a difference. And I was given the space to make that difference in terms of developing a leadership demonstration program um, that has a ripple effect right across, not just the NHS. Recently, I was speaking um, with the Leadership Academy in the Nuclear Armament um, Agency. And my work at that time had an impact in setting the stage of what a good leadership development program could be. So that came from a nurse. So you know, so I'm very proud of things like that. You know, when we look at the um, uh, education and community, what is happening at the community level. Health promotion, health education is just so important. And I don't think it's given the opportunities anymore. Health visitors and midwives going into school and, and really contributing to um, the curriculum had a strong impact. What have we done? We have taken away a lot of that. And as a matter of that, our communities are poorer. Our communities are poorer. And I, I don't feel we are making sufficient noise about that. And there's more, but I'll come back. <laughs> I have a lot to say on that. Jane, if I uh, ask you to build on that as well. You're on mute. I agree with Neslin, but I also think um, we have to, the challenges with our huge workforce that we need to focus both on the on all in all the, the whole spectrum. And I think the real challenge for me continues to be that um, leadership at the very top of nursing um, needs to be stronger. 
And there are so few opportunities still to have effective leadership programs and leadership development, especially um, I'm not interested so much in the programs where you go away somewhere and you hear about the theory of leadership and then you come back to your workplace. It's about developmental opportunities for leaders within the workplace, because if we don't have people at the top tables, whether the top table is in your hospital or in government or in your um, whatever, if you don't have people there, and if you don't have people who are effective when they get there, because so many of us, we get there and then you might be the only room in a, uh, the only woman in a room full of men or you, you talk and you feel your voice is squeaky, all those things. So if we can't do that to be effective policy advocates and activists, we're, we're going to continue to be in trouble because our situation has not changed, changed enough. Things aren't changing far enough, fast enough. So I think we need to do that. And then the other bit I want to say about it is that we it means we have to learn how to play the political game. But we also need how to we also need to change the rules. And that's quite a difficult balance. So you need to be both to be as good as the people who are in the traditional roles and to be able to 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 feel you're there the equal and not to feel frightened to challenge. But at the same time, you've got to be subversive to make things move along and change. So I think there's lots of balancing acts in that. But of course, it can begin right at the beginning. If with the students, you've got mentors, you've got the teachers encouraging that rather than saying, don't speak up because you'll threaten your career, which is the kind of yeah. thing that I was told. David, that's uh, we, you're in the United States. You've been there for a number of years now. You grew up in the NHS. Do we see the same problem in the US? Is this a home nation's problem about you must fit into a box. You must be in a position. You know, is, is there more energy around nursing in the United States? So I want to kind of link it to the point that, that Jean made about leadership at the top. Um, I would say that um, there is huge diversity, whichever nation you go to. And, I, and I've been privileged to visit many nations. Um, and it is about the role models that people have that can that they can emulate. And I think one of the things that we do as nurses is we actually downplay the contribution that we make. We do not celebrate our successes often enough and we do not put them forward as exemplars for others to offer constructive criticism, um, potentially adopting or modifying them as well. I know when I was working as a director of nursing in Scotland, one of the things that we were able to do was to identify a wide range of really outstanding examples from the community, from the secondary level services, from the tertiary level ser services, and just act actually just celebrate those successes. And when you start to identify and celebrate those successes, you start to build a momentum. And I think that's part of what we need to do is to take time to identify and promote some of the great work that nurses are already doing. You know, whether I was visiting nurses in Rwanda or whether I was with nurses here in Chicago or in, in, in parts of the, of the UK, um, every single place I went to, I saw examples of outstanding practice. But the, the nurses themselves would often say, well, that's just what we do. But what they do is phenomenal. And, and what we've got to do is to take those examples and highlight them for our politicians, for our political leaders that can then see the real power of effective nursing practice and how it can make a difference to the health and well-being of nations. The, thank you, David. I, I, was, I was just digesting what, what you're saying there. Um, Lord Nigel Crisp, who, who's just um, was championing the Nursing Now campaign and again looking at the all party parliamentary group in the United Kingdom, looking at some of these issues around mental health and well being of the workforce, also looking at the future of the workforce, uh, has really come on board as the former chief executive. We've got the the former minister, Jeremy Hunt, really now saying you're one of his biggest uh, you know, mistakes was not addressing the workforce issues. Um, 
how, how do we communicate? Why is it that, you know, we, you've got some examples like you all recognize, real examples of exemplary behavior, making the change, the leadership in the menu. But something seems to be at the, the you know, as we rise up, we're not having the same voice. And then it's only as people leave that they're suddenly now becoming workforce champions. Um, <laughs> what's the disconnect here? Um, Jane, Nestle, you're, you know, you're there in the UK. You're dealing with the civil service. You're dealing with government. What's the disconnect? Oh, go, Jane, I'll follow. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you mention Nigel, Chris, because I wonder whether to tell a little story, and I'm sure he won't mind. If, I don't know if he's listening in or not. But I worked with him on the um, triple impact report because when he was uh, he was chairing the all party parliamentary group on global health and I was an advisor to it. And he I had tea with him in the House of Lords one day and he said and they'd done a series of really excellent reports. And always my comments were, but where is the nursing in this? You know, nurses just didn't appear in the reports. Anyway, one day he said, let's see, we had tea and he said, I think we should do a short report on nursing. And I think he thought I'd be really delighted. And you can imagine, can you imagine what I said? I said, a short report. Why does it need to be short? We are the biggest part of the workforce. He sort of sat back a little bit sort of. But anyway, so on we went. We did the report and it was a fantastic process and very exciting. And Nigel, who had been head of the um, UK National Health Service, among many other distinguished posts, when we launched the report, he said, he said, I've learned so much from this process. I thought I knew about nursing. And now I realize I didn't really know about nursing. And I thought he was extraordinarily honest to admit that. And if you think someone of his experience and in that position doesn't know enough about nursing, what is it? Is it that he had a deaf ear or is it that we still have not learned how to be good advocates, to find the right people that we need to influence and to find the words, to be persuasive, to win the arguments, to present the data. So there's something about that that we either don't feel confident enough to do, I'm only a nurse, you know, that phrase that we all dread, some low self-esteem, the women's issues. So I think it's, we're still some way to go. And I think it's sort of some ideas about how we might improve that apart from more leadership programs would be a very useful idea. And Jim, you could tell us because you you you're not a nurse. What is it that floats your boat when that what is it that turns you into thinking, yes, I've got to do something about that? The uh for me personally, I mean a lot of people say, why nursing, Jim? Why why are you so involved with nursing midwifery? And and for colleagues around the world, you know, I was the uh, the lead uh, or sort of primary investigator on the, the first state of the world's midwifery report, the second, and then we we developed with colleagues, with partners, it's always with partners, uh, the first state of the world's nursing here in WHO and, and, and the international year. To me, not only, I mean, my family, um, we have nurses surrounded, surrounded in all parts of the family. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, my nurse relatives in the United Kingdom, here in Switzerland, and in Kosovo, all in, infected with COVID-19. Um, in the high income countries of the United Kingdom and here in Switzerland, full recovery survival in Kosovo, which is modern day Europe, but with less resources, unfortunately, no oxygen and uh, a relative passed away. Uh, and that's the, the issue here. How do we have equity? How do we drive the same opportunities around the world? But also the science, the evidence uh, is really, we know the evidence, we know the impact that they're making day in, day out. If, we, if, we, if you believe in public health, you have to believe in the scope of practice of nursing to make a difference. Um, it's, it's just, it's in your face. However, we're not getting that message across. We, we, we recognize that. Is it because we're too shy? Is it because we're too, or you're too humble? Um, is it because we don't, you know, put ourselves forward and take credit in, in the institutions and the facilities? Lots of these challenges. But Nestle, again, I, I want to come to you because you know the politics of the UK. You know the issues here. Excellent example from Lord Nigel Crisp, who recognised you know, he's leading, he's still learning, even having retired, being part of the Lords, he's coming back to some of these issues. 
who else have we got? What is, as an RCN fellow, who have we got to influence? We have got to um, influence every healthcare organization. So, for example, at um, trust level, to what extent are workforce issues sufficiently prioritized and strategically placed on, 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 on at the board? And we know that not every organization has a chief um, people officer, but we'll have a human resource development officer, an HID of director. There are not always executive officers, you know, and I think until we actually grip, and I think we do need to grip the issues around the workforce and the statistics, the impact and all of that, and then be able to speak that in a language that local politics and national politics can actually understand. In my role as chairman, and I, I, I spent 21 continuous years as non-executive director in the health service, including 10 years as chairman. And I saw how important it was to really have the nursing voice at a strategic level in the organization. And in my own role as chairman, I ensured that nursing voices is really went into strong commissioning forces. Because as I said, nurses are involved from the cradle to the grave. And when you have a good nursing voice, you get better commissioning. When you have um, the, 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 the issues regarding the workforce presented at the board in a way that board members can actually begin to see the correlation or uh, see the match between safety, excellence in care, and workforce numbers and quality. You know, one of the first things we do, we, we tend to cut training and development, you know, and that is something we, sh we should be increasing more and more and more. And as Jane has already said, not around just uh, understand leadership theories, that's important, but the whole point around leading at the top is to really say, you know, what's working well, what's difficult, and how do we continue to improve and impact the quality of care? Following a patient journey, I learned such a lot a couple of times when I actually followed a patient journey that I saw where the weaknesses were. And it's so important. Indeed. Um, we're getting to that stage where I want to, to really engage with our participants on International Nurses Day. Thank you to everyone that's been chatting uh, in the thing from James Cook University, from Kath, uh, Alan Ramsey, uh, Kath McCourt's in there, Joanne Bosenke, all names I, I've I've met uh, over the years or, or seen on Twitter. Um, we've got young students uh, absolutely engaged. You, what are some of your questions and, and concerns uh, coming through? What, there's one question here for you, Nestling, uh, around the Francis report. You know, and the whole issue, you know, we do these assessments, we look into these problems, we identify recommendations and solutions. Does change happen and, and does change happen fast enough or not at all? Um, from a leadership perspective, from your insights, you know, where, where are we with the Francis report and implementing some of those recommendations? I do think that there isn't sufficient commitment there. I think that's that's first and foremost. The commitment isn't there. You know, when I look back to what some of the issues were 30 years ago, we're dealing with the same issues now. So where is the change? What has happened? Uh, I see it's three steps forward, two steps backwards all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, there isn't sufficient value and sufficient love for each other. It's as simple as that. 30 years on and we're still not having that human appreciation. Um, David, your reflections of change 
in the UK. Scotland is is making progress. So we're not to, we're seeing a new strategy on workforce integrated health and social services, nursing at really at the forefront of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, a couple of points I'd want to make is I, th I think one of the things that we've also got to recognise is that we're not in this on our own and actually building alliances with patient groups and with other um, entities can be really, really powerful. And certainly some of the work that I've been doing in the US over the last few years where we've been working very closely with military families to change legislation across the nation. We've managed to get legislation now passed in 37 of the states, um, which is not a small task. And that's been done through collaboration, not just on the efforts of nurses, but on the efforts of those that we serve as well. So I think that's something we need to think about. And, and certainly when you look at the work um, that's come out of Scotland recently, recognition of the changing demographics and the changing health needs is going to be critical. So the, the model that we had in the past um, is not going to be fit for the future. And therefore the health and social care interface, how we regulate that, how we educate those individuals for the future is going to be really important. But for me, the biggest issue in terms of the visibility of nursing is the fact that nursing is still costed as part of bed and board of services. It's not, act you can't actually uh, go into the electronic health record and actually identify what it is that nurses are doing 24-7, 365. Because when you start to look at that, that kind of level of data, then you start to see the real value of the profession. So I was I was really pleased, Jim, to see comments made in the triad report about the need for much greater data, because that is going to be essential if we are really going to move forward the agenda in terms of the real contribution of the nursing profession to the future health and well-being of societies. Jane, that's, if we can pick up on David's point here about the, the Scotland strategy, looking at the demographics, looking at the changing needs, then thinking about how education and regulation changes to that so that we're really putting people at the centre, um, whether it's the people who need health prevention promotion services, whether it's the people who provide those, those care services. A yeah. Again, what's the... You know, as fellows, where, where, where can I RCN be adding some value to these processes? I think that I've got so many different thoughts. I'm just trying to sort of align them. I think what I was, as David was talking, Leslie was talking, what was going through my mind was, Again, these are issues we've been working on for a long time. I think the data issues are really important, that we have that information, that we then know how to use it and that it's an iterative process. And we have so much information and excellent reports, not least the ones that your department and others put, put out. But can I tell you, I was saying, thinking about something a bit different and wider. It might take a different... Go ahead. But what I was thinking is that actually, if you look at where we are in the world today, it's a pretty depressing prospect, isn't it? We're just kind of trying to come through COVID, but of course, in many countries, it's far from over. And, and we have the war in Ukraine and we have the climate crisis and it's frightening. I feel more depressed about it all than I think I have at any time in my life. And I'm one of the lucky ones who was born after the Second World War and haven't had to live through that directly. But what it says to me is that we have to maybe find some new ways of approaching the old issues because the new issues are supervening all the time. And that classic thing about the crisis being an opportunity that maybe while we're busy collecting the data, the goalposts have changed. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I'm just thinking maybe we, if we, you know that, if we carry on doing what we always did, we'll get what we always got. How can we actually be more nimble, provide that flexibility of leadership and the inspiration to people to go beyond these terrible divisions that we see all around us to actually create what Leslie said, just societies? And I know that's not your, the question you asked, but for me, it's a kind of overarching sense because I don't know about you. I look at the news every morning with absolute dread and think, what next? So how can we turn that 
pessimism into something that's going to really help to move the world to a better place. Absolutely, Jane. We, we had these discussions in the triad meeting just this week. Um, the pressures that are on healthcare systems worldwide at the moment and on the people in those healthcare systems. And then waking up and reading the news about the challenges around the world. And yes, climate, yes, the, the conflict in Europe, but also the conflict in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Mali. Um, we, we must remember there's, there are protracted crises and conflicts that have been going on for six years with, with less attention. And, and we've got to recognize that the, there is a media uh, element about that. But there was also a sense of opportunity. And not that this crisis, there was a real sense of opportunity as we listened to the different experiences about making, using data to inform dialogue, to, to then try and create decisions for the better. Uh, and that there was an opportunity that the appreciation for the role of nurses and midwives worldwide coming out of the pandemic is a once in, in a generation, once in several generations opportunity and so let's let's rather than dwell on the pessimism let's let's think about that opportunity and where we can go um, we had Amy who's a, a student nurse asking about what are the opportunities for um, nurse students to have a voice and get engaged in identifying solutions um, but David Neslin please you know what are the opportunities coming out of this what what, what can we do better what can we do well David so so I think the, the first thing I would I would know is that um, uh, early on in the pandemic I, I went I went to see what lessons could be learned from the past and actually whilst we've had a number of um, not not as serious as the the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic we've had a number of incidences over the years very little had actually been documented about that. This time around, nursing has risen to the challenge and has actually shared its experience. And we've got to capture that and we've got to utilise that because what it did demonstrate was that the profession was able to respond quickly, to come together and collaborate, working with my colleagues here in the United States with the American Nurses Association, the American Association of Colleges, the National League and the American Organization of Nursing Leadership. Collectively, we came together and really pushed an agenda, which was saying these are the really important things. So it's actually about prioritizing, learning, and moving forward. And whilst we are um, in some parts of the world starting to kind of come out of this first phase of all of this, we are going to see an opportunity for technology that we've never seen before. So, you know, the question from uh, the student nurse about, you know, what, 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 can nurse, what can student nurses do? They have got to embrace some of these opportunities and demand from their educators a different approach to actually preparing them for a new future, not a, a, a future that, you know, Jane Neslin and I were trained in 40 years ago. That's, that's not where we're at. We've got to look to the future and actually embrace technology in a way, looking at population health needs, because sadly, in many countries at the moment, the, um, the age um, of, um, of, I mean, the, 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 the kind of um, age of many of our citizens is actually going down. It's not going up because of things like chronic, uh, chronic diseases, which um, we have a solution for. We know what the solution is, but we've actually got to embrace that both in the community and in hospital and in schools um, as part of this agenda. Thanks, you, David. We've got Dr. Crystal Oldman um, on, on the chat saying, you know, there are examples of this optimism where it is working, where it, there is real improvement. There's a, a, a strong workforce, good leadership and everything else. Uh, similarly, Nestlin, you know, again, from what's the opportunity and what, what can we be doing to really take advantage of these unique circumstances? I think that we have huge opportunities. And I, um, David mentioned, you know, 
there is huge learning that we can actually do from, from our younger people. They are more adept with technology than we will ever be. We need to bring, bring them into the strategies um, um, for the technology and, and the implementation. So let's go forward and involve um, the younger voices, involve the students. When we talk about policies and practice, you know, it starts from the very, it starts at a very early stage and we need to bring them in. Indeed. Uh, Beverly Dean's asking a question. How, how can we deal with the big retention issue? How can we, what are your thoughts, panel? We're hearing stories of intention to leave as really escalating, that all these pressures, all the experiences, the lived experience kept coming out of that. How do we deal with re attrition and retention? What's going to, leadership, what, what's the role here? So Jim, if I can jump in there, I mean, I think one of the things we've got to differentiate is between those people that are genuinely completely burnt out and want to exit the profession and those that are actually leaving a particular job because the uh, terms and conditions of that particular job isn't um, as, as, as positive as it should be. And I think we've got to differentiate on some of those things. We've also got to recognise that there are generational changes taking place. When um, you know, when when I went into nursing, it was it was viewed that I would probably going to be there for the remainder of my career. But we now know with the generational changes that people will change career several times. We haven't actually thought through what that means in terms of how we capture experience from one sector and we facilitate entry into another sector. So we're starting to see some of that in terms of people that have maybe done a degree in, in biology and how you can fast track them into nursing, et cetera. But really thinking about some of the, the wealth of experience that people have. These are some of the discussions that as a profession and as a society we need to have if we're really going to address this recruitment retention issue, because it is not just about nursing. This is actually a, a fundamental shift within society. Thanks, David. And I think that's a really key point here about uh, that you're making on, on several points. But one that I really heard there is question the, the, the data, question the evidence, and differentiate that because there are underlying some of those figures as, is some very positive turnover as well as some of that burnout uh, as well. Jane, Neslin, thoughts on retention, thoughts on attrition? I, I will need to leave very short, shortly. So after we... my two pennies <laughs> worth, I'm going to say, you know, but in, 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 in stopping the burnout, we need to take action at the very top leadership at the top to stop the burnout. We need to take um, leadership in ensure that um, people are not being discriminated against. We, so uh, we need to ensure that when we bring international uh, recruitment into the game, that uh, nurses are, and midwives are properly um, onboarded and that they are properly inducted. We need to ensure that, you know, when we take people from very skilled areas, you know, for example, I was hearing um, conversations about very skilled neonatal nurses from New Zimbabwe who were um, recruited. And when they came into this uh, country after a while, they were put into um, elderly care without where they haven't had the experience and were just treated as a pair of hands. And, uh, and so again, proper workforce planning, proper workforce analysis to make sure that we are not discriminating, that we are treating people honestly and with integrity, that we are creating those environments that is just, and um, that we are not being sexist and racist in any way. And with sadness, I have to leave because my husband will be divorcing me if I don't <laughs> get myself sorted to get to the opera with him. <laughs> okay, Neslin, thank you. It's been wonderful to hear from you. And, and, and actually, thank you for, you know, talking about some of the elephant in the room here, sexism, racism, justice, social justice, uh, but, migration. Yeah. Um, uh, as an issue, we've we've seen the vice president of Zimbabwe uh, saying to the UK government, "You owe me a hundred million dollars." 
uh, for the Zimbabwean nurses you're taking. And exactly that from the intensive care unit into elderly care. Um, so thank you very much, Nestle. Appreciate it. Enjoy your evening. Happy International Nurses Day. Jane, I want to stay on this topic. Oh. You know, Nestle has left us with some of the, these big <laughs> issues. This is what politics is about, the politics yep. of nursing, surely, yep. to be it able is. to address these issues. It is, and it takes me back to, the, to my book and what, I, what we were fighting for then, and it takes me also back to the, um, the incredible strength that the RCN has as both a professional organisation and as a trade union. And I think, you know, we haven't talked much about the money, but if you haven't got proper funding to enable people to earn a decent wage and to enable the improvements in working conditions, you will continue to see the hemorrhage of people. And, you know, we have to address that. And it's uncomfortable and it can and has caused sort of, it's difficult for an organisation to straddle those different areas, but it is one of the strengths of the RCN, RCN and of its fellowship. So I think we mustn't forget that, that they are political issues about where the money goes. And when you look at how billions are spent on certain things and not others and all the wide issues around taxation and who pays what, I think we can't let that slide. It's, it's just critical. And of course, having got the money, it then has to be spent properly. But um, I mean, the question people always ask me is, you know, why, why are so many people leaving nursing? And I say, well, put it the other way. Why would anyone stay? You yeah. know, why would people stay? Because when I see what my colleagues in, in management and in clinical areas are going through and they're on their knees, and of course, they've held the line throughout the pandemic. And I'm talking not just about the UK. Um, and then, you know, you think, I can't do this anymore. The crisis is sort of partly passed in some places. And that's when you really when the burnout really kicks in. So we have to go back to some of the good old trade union basics about, you know, decent wages, decent conditions and decent pay. Indeed. And, and, and we've got comments here. Some muscle, yeah, you know? we've got comments here from Kim, comments from Beverly Dean. Indeed, about some of these the, these experiences of the workplace, uh, the issues. David, I, I want to stay on this theme, but in the triad statement, and, and as a former chief exec of the International Council of Nurses, you're very familiar with how the partnership works. In the triad statement, the, the key points are talking to these issues. How do we have the ILO Nursing Convention reaffirmed, reinforced to protect people in the workplace? How do we have the working conditions, the WHO's new Global Health and Care Worker Compact, which is all about the rights of all health workers and the responsibilities of employers or governments to those workers, uh, the code of practice and migration. These are all issues that are in the triad statement. It's clearly of concern here in the home nations from our audience in, in, in Australia and elsewhere. Your thoughts from both, not from your just only your unique role in, in the US, but from your, your fellowship role and your ICN previous history. So, Jim, I think, I think you're right. And I think part of what we've got to do is to provide new insights into some of these older problems. And certainly, I remember um, at one point, been asked by the, the nursing standard if I would uh, talk about the importance of leadership within the nursing profession. And I said, I would only do it if I could do that as a dialogue with a newly qualified nurse. So someone that was brand new into the profession, because I think the insights that people bring when they are fresh to the profession are different from those that have seen it several times over. And it's by having those dialogues that I think it's really important. I think one of the things that WHO has done um, recently or relatively recently is really to embrace some of the other UN agencies in some of the work that uh, you've been doing. Um, because I think it's only when the different agencies come together that we're not just simply dealing with the health ministry but we're now dealing with the Department of Labor or the finance departments that we're really going to start to see movement. So bringing new perspectives, coordinating perspectives, because, you know, the, the health minister is one person in a cabinet. 
And if you can get the Minister of Finance um, and the Minister of Education all asking for the same thing, then your chances of actually getting success is, is much more important. So I, I think what we've got to do with things like the, the triad communication is to look for more partners in terms of moving these agenda, agendas forward if we're going to be successful, um, making sure that new perspectives are brought to bear um, because there is no such thing as a silly idea. It's a perspective that makes you stop and think and come up with a better solution. Indeed, and that, I, I welcome those reflections, David. We're seeing, you know, part of the yesterday, the President Biden, uh, the White House announced a new uh, global health worker initiative. Um, so, you know, the, the White House and the Democratic Party saying these are areas that we want to take forward. Uh, really encouraging that they're talking about protecting the workers against the COVID pandemic, making sure that vaccine safety protection in the workplace. They're talking about women in the workforce. They're talking about pay equity. Uh, they're also highlighting some of the evidence that WHO published, as you say, with other UN agencies, with the International Labour Organization, with the uh, Organization of Economic Co on the economic value of investing in Nurses, Jane, you talked about the triple impact report uh, for nurses, which had these impacts on gender, impacts on the economy. Um, is, are we all familiar with this language? Are we, you know, you're saying, David, it's good to see that you've got that international experience. For our participants here, do we get those messages out to people who are in the practice environments? Jane. Well, I think we, we tried to make those arguments in the triple impact report. and. Some of you may remember the um, Gordon Brown's Prime Minister's Commission on the Future of Nursing in England, where we also, uh, with a you know, very sort of extensive exercise of consultation with nurses and the public, a uh, wide range of inputs, we also there tried to make the arguments about the social capital that nurses bring um, to try and frame the what can sound rather economistic arguments, they're important, but to frame them in a wider social context. So you, you're thinking about social capital, human capital. But the problem is with all these reports that those of us whose job is often to read the reports, you know, we sort of read them and we take them seriously and we publish them. But, you know, it's, it's how to get these messages across, how to be better advocates. And that's a big part of the leadership training that many of us are involved in now is how we can encourage nurses to be to have these ideas at their fingertip to be able to talk about them not from a nursey point of view but actually to be able to hold your own in a group of, of a mixed group of people on a committee or in a meeting or whatever where you're not actually starting with the word nurse you're actually saying look minister I can help you solve that problem in this way so it's really trying to turn it around to be an advocate in a in a more sophisticated way rather than what we tend to do because we're passionate and excited and we say you must do more for nurses actually it's about this is what we can do for you and I think we need therefore then to have those arguments at our fingertips in language that they understand and if they're politicians the only thing they really understand is who's going to vote for me and will I get the vote if I do that so I think being more political in that um politically savvy way and being able to use the evidence that we've amassed in your reports, in our reports, in our CN reports, but really to just have them there at our fingertips and use them appropriately in the right forum. Indeed. And maybe that's uh, uh, an opportunity for the, the Royal College of Nurses uh, with the fellows, with the members. How do we get those critical messages out? How do we cascade them down? How do we get people with those talking points in leadership? discussions, in policy discussions um, to get that down, especially on the, you know, the sector Q in the, in the four home nations. Sector Q is, is the classification of occupations in sectors in any single country. So it's in the health and social care sectors. It is one of the, the largest sectors. It's the largest employer of women as a share 
compared to any other sectors. It offers huge opportunity for young people in terms of tertiary education. It has an impact on economic empowerment uh, across all regions. So there's all these additional benefits, um, but you think that the solutions to come with it. Uh, David, Jane, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you just to get stop and pause for a moment and think. I'm going to come to you. You know, what are your final reflections here? Um, we started with the discussion around Catherine Hall, the picture of, of a great nursing leader. Um, Alan, Alan from James Cook was saying that maybe she was in the post too long and, and Margaret Thatcher took advantage of her. Uh, that was right back at the beginning. Um, but a great nursing leader, they're having a role and opportunity to inform policy and politics. David's talked about the, the small P, the big P. We've talked about plenty of examples. Why should politics be every nurse's business? Uh, what is the power and the potential of being political in your nursing profession, in your nursing practice, in your nursing activism? Uh, Jane, that this is your bread and butter. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you. In two minutes to leave some key messages, some key takeaways for the, the participants on International Nursing Day, um, some thoughts and reflections on that. Jane, you're looking very pensive now. Um, <laughs> you're in Florence. You, you've been to the, the Nightingale reception. You can, it's okay. I'm trying, no, no pressure. Um, who wants to go first? I was looking pensive because I was thinking it's been such a, a rich, wide ranging discussion, how to distill the um, the real important essences of it. And also in the chat, there's been so much interesting stuff. So it's um, it's hard to summarize. But I suppose um, I'm left perhaps I'm left feeling, which is a good thing, more optimistic than I felt when I started the call, because I do feel pretty, you know, even though I'm in Florence and it's lovely, I feel so concerned about what's going on in the world and in my own little world as well as and people's access to healthcare and so on as well as in my wider professional world and worldwide um but i think the discussion has has reminded me of the enormous strength of the profession and all the great minds and and um hearts that we have in it that actually we can and do make a difference and it doesn't mean signing up to some kind of fake unity, but it does mean having good grown-up discussions about the areas that we need to concentrate on, agreeing to disagree about some things, but then saying, which is politics, here's the common ground. This is what we must go for. This is how we can advocate for it. This is how we're going to encourage and train the emerging leaders, the young, to join us older ones in moving forward for social justice. And using all those things that WHO does so well about collecting the data and putting it out there in ways that we can all use in our advocacy and in our reports, I think all that's very positive. So although the future is uncertain and in some ways dark, I think there are always opportunities in crisis. And I think the, the resilience and the compassion and the um, intelligence of nurses surely between us worldwide and now with the RCN and its fellows back in the um, in the international frame through the ICN as well as in the triad and other wonderful fora. It's a fantastic opportunity to remind ourselves that we are and can be a social movement of our own as well as part of wider social movements. So I think a bit of onward and upward and encouragement is, is my sort of takeaway really. And I'm glad we've we've made sure that you're a bit more optimistic as well. <laughs> it, it's infectious. Uh, it can have an impact everywhere. Opportunity, opportunity. David, same same issues. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm reminded of something that a former uh, chief nurse of Scotland said to me at one point in in, in my career. Uh, Anne Jarvie um, said, "You know, when nursing works together, it is a force." for change and a force for good. And sometimes you have to ask for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. And I do think 
we need to um, Jane mentioned the word subversive, and I, I, I think one of the things we need to be is responsibly subversive. We've actually got to just grab the bull by the horns and, and, and move, move, move the agenda forward. We've got such talent within the profession, and we actually need to capitalise upon that. So the question you asked about, you know, is, politi is politics every person's business? I would say it's maybe not every person's business, but it should be every nurse's business to get involved because whether you're talking at uh, as a student nurse within the educational setting and, and making sure that that educational experience is future orientated, there's a role there. There are insights that you gain from talking to individuals within the clinical arena that you can bring a new. Uh, the one thing I really enjoyed when I was working um, in the clinical setting was students coming in and asking why. Why do you do this? That's a really powerful question. And it's something that we should ask of ourselves. Why are we doing this? Is there a better way to do it? And you asked Jane about um, some of the many reports that are being published. I think one of the things that the Royal College and indeed other organisations could do is when these reports are published, to publish alongside them the 30-second elevator speech in terms of what's in it for the profession and how can the profession contribute to solve the problems Jane was absolutely right. If you go to a minister, if you go to a chief executive of, a, of an institution and say, I've got a solution for you, their ears prick up, they listen to what you're saying, and they're more likely to move in that direction. Whereas if you say, uh, can you do this for me? They, they've shut off straight away. So I think there's a number of things that we could do collectively together. Um, there's a huge amount of resources out there, um, and we just need to... Um, utilise them to their fullest. I mean, Jim, WHO over the years, not just at headquarters level, but in the regional offices, have produced some fabulous, absolutely fabulous resources. And I'm not sure that everyone is aware of their existence and the utility that they have. So just promote what we've got, redesign for the future, and work together because together we will achieve far more. Jane, David, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, as I said at the beginning, my, my role was also partly be the, to the chief timekeeper uh, for today, but I just want to try and capture some of the key points that we've heard and then and just then make a few housekeeping statements. Um, clearly, we're hearing that there is an opportunity, that there is excellent practice that demonstrates that we don't have to look at the, the, the world around us, the conflict around us, the difficulties around us and do nothing. We can take action. That action, we're solution-oriented, using our data, using the opportunity of partnership, engaging student voices, uh, means that we can find an opportunity to make improvements, to make change uh, in the role of nursing, using this role of nursing and politics to get further forward. We don't need to seek permission. There you go. You heard it from an RCN fellow. You don't need to seek permission. You can ask those difficult questions, those probing questions to move further forward. There's an opportunity with technology and, and with our students and early career professionals and their engagement with technology to do things differently. We've learned from COVID. Scope of practice has changed. Engagement and education, engagement in clinical services has changed. What opportunity to really reaffirm, reinforce the stuff that's working well that makes patients happy. We need to address staff safety. We need to address patient safety and put it all together in the way that we do in working with communities and others. Um, colleagues, it's International Nurses Day. It's the 12th 
of May, on the 5th of May, we had International Day of the Midwives. On the 4th of May, we had Star Wars Day, which was May the 4th be with you. And David, that's what you're saying. It is make sure that we are a force for good. We are a force for good. Nurses, it's a bit like that, that classic line in um, Hamilton, the, the movie, Hamilton, the theater. Immigrants, we get the job done. You know, nurses, we get the job done. Uh, let me thank uh, Jane, David Nestling. Uh, let me also thank all the colleagues in the RCN, the library, the archive team, uh, Daniels and others. Let me thank Kath McCourt, uh, who put this panel together and, and is helping and supporting the fellows committee. Um, please do. There's a message in there from the RCN colleagues. There is an evaluation form. Uh, take just 10 seconds, you know, two minutes, a minute before you jump into your glass of wine or whatever it is on Nurses Day. Jump in and do that. For those in Washington marching down the parade to recognize those nurses that have lost their lives and those who are ill, yeah, may, may the fourth be with you as well. Um, and to everyone, thank you very much. Politics is part of the nursing profession. Make it part of your practice. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening, day, wherever you may be. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thanks very much, uh, everyone. Um, I'm just going to leave the chat open for a few minutes uh, more so that people can click on the links uh, if they like to. But please just feel free to leave as soon as you're ready. Are we muted now? Um... Sarah, or, or they can still hear us? Um, yes, everyone can still hear. Um, at oh, the okay, so it's not a confident. But anyway, thank you very much, RCN. Happy, uh, happy evening and everything else. Um, stay well, stay happy. Thank you, Jim. I thought you did a fantastic job in such a really wide-ranging... I thought you, you did it brilliantly. And you know I'm not prone to give you lots of compliments, but I've, you know, <laughs> I thought you deserved one this time. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Absolutely, Jim. <laughs> you take take care and thanks very much for a great a great evening